This is a post mill, uh, which is the oldest type of mills in, in the UK. Um, essentially, the idea is if you build a windmill to capture the power of the wind, yes, um, like on this model, yes. so the wind's blowing, our sails turn, um, we can use that to turn mechanisms inside, run stones, take belt drives off, do anything we want, mm. essentially. Um, that's great as long as the wind's obviously blowing. It becomes a bit of a problem if the wind changes direction and blows from a different direction. Yeah. The way they so solved it with the post mills is essentially to be able to turn the whole building. Yeah. So they would have a big beam out the back um, and you could turn the whole building around to, yeah, face, to face the wind. Mm -hmm. um, the later development, which is on here, is the fan tail, um, which essentially, mm -hmm. when the wind blows from the side like it is today, that will turn that fan tail, um, like on here. Oh yeah. The fan tail then drives some gearing mechanism to those big iron wheels yes. and then turns them and would literally do the same job and turn the building around. Um, by, by pulling the this one's 1681, yeah. Um, obviously once the fan tail gets around to the back of the building and is protected from the wind by the, by the rest of the building, it would, it would stop so the thing would be left yeah. facing things. So it becomes autonomous. And once you've devised that, then really that opens the whole world for building the smock mills, which are the, essentially the wooden clad tower mills. Yeah. Um, and then obviously progressing from those to the, to the tower mills. The advantage of the tower mills and that, which is why the post mills disappeared, is because these, are so, these can be so much bigger. Yeah. Central post, the main post, that goes up through the floor of the bus, to the new cross tree. Um, which essentially the rest of the building is built off of, so it's like a huge roundabout for the better description up there. Um, this is one piece of wood, this is an entire tree of oak. You build a big A-frame block and tackle, um, use horses. That goes up vertical, the weight of the building is then taken through the quarter bars. Yeah. So there's four of those that go down to the brick pillars in the corners. Okay. Those basically keep it off the ground so it doesn't rot as quickly. Yes. Protects it. it also gives you something that you can work with wedges and chocks to, to basically make the whole thing vertical. The purpose of, this, of the cross tees at the bottom is to hold this in place mm. and stop it wobbling. They don't actually take any weight. All the weight goes through the quarter bars. So these will literally just anchor it in place so it, it stays vertical. Right. Well, that works. So it would be spinning at the moment because the wind's coming from the other side of the hedge. Turn the gear mechanism and run the wheel so we can do that. Way. If you can see, well, you can see the wheels turn, you can yeah. see the sails are being dragged. Yeah. Yeah.
So you'd literally do that when there was sail cloth. yourself on to your next sail. To repeat the process. Obviously if the wind starts catching them they start moving on their own so you'd have to dip inside and put the brake on to stop it. The spider, the black cross in the centre and then that's connected to the striking rod and then through through the cams to the mechanism. And then move yourself on to your next sail. We need to get those trimmed, don't we? <laughs> Tight, that's off the, the back of the wind shaft through the brake wheel there and now it's driven so when it's slack I can turn that yeah, yeah. pull it down now I can't turn it, it locks it off right. and essentially if the sails was now turning that rock the sack hoist itself would start revolving as well because it's under drive right. it then yanks this chain up wind this chain up and would draw up any sack that's tied on the bottom of the chain. two hoppers up here because there's two pairs of stones. In here is two sets of stones, one in a box so they would both be boxed up like that when, when they were in use and one which is just the bedstone here. This one's made out of a substance called French burr which would come from France in pieces. So you can see essentially the lines where it was block paved it's meant to be like that, so it would come in pieces, a guy would basically assemble it on site um, and then they'd put the band on it to hold it together, fill any cracks with plaster of Paris. Um, they used it because it produces a very fine stone, so there's a bit here which hasn't gone rotten, where it's still really shiny like granite. Oh right, yes. Um, so it would produce the best mm. flower, the yeah. finest flower. Uh, the drive comes up from underneath to the runner stone which basically would be rested on here and would be the one that's spinning on the top. Um, the runner stone is then fed from the hopper above through that minor hopper which has got a leather strap in it which essentially would be held down with the, by the weight of grain and then you've got a, a square shaped cross shaped cog coming up through the middle here which has caused this shoe to rattle as it keeps knocking it, yeah. So that essentially you do that, which would basically feed the grain through and then through the top of the hole in the top of the runner stone. When this hopper becomes empty, the leather strap would drop and then it allow this bell to drop down and start bouncing off that as well. So it was really noisy as well as dusty. How did, they, how did they move the stones? So you just set up a block and tackle and that in here, take it off one of the big beams to lift it off because really? they will wear 
yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. So every now and again, you'd have to take them off and have them redressed. These grooves. Yeah. So there's all grooves in the cut into the stone. These all need to be cut and sharpened because the stone actually works like a pair of scissors. Mm -hmm. So yeah. those grooves will yeah. go against each other and, it's, and and cut the grain initially into into pieces, and then the pieces are polished to the flour as they run across the flat and out the side. Okay. As it runs out the side into the box. That's the brake band around it, which is what we can use to stop the sails. So I'll show you that in a second. Oh, I see. Um, that then goes onto this wallow, which is made of cast iron in this case, and is in most of the, the later ones. But you always have wood onto iron. There's no metal on metal in the windmill because the flower is highly flammable. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they didn't want any sparks being generated. Mm. So then the drive goes down from there and then both ways to the two sets of stones. Mm. So we see the drive transfer downstairs. This, this is little flap, as I discovered the other week when you lift it up. It's a little hole. That's probably where you, you see you pour, pour your grease and that down there so you can lubricate the top of the main post. I thought of everything. Well, yeah. So if you see this good spot is where it literally says brake band, you should see that outer ring move in and pinch the brake wheel. Yes, oh yes. Yeah. That's taking it off. Um, and you can see that just sits there. The metal ring isn't actually a bearing, that's just a metal ring that stops it wandering. Yeah. So if you keep moving that. On, around on top of the post, it'll have a habit of walking off. Um, obviously, you don't want that to happen. So that's what that does. So this is our, our drive from the wallower upstairs through to this spur wheel, and then out to the two stone nuts. This one's disengaged at the moment. You can see it's obviously clear. Again, there's wooden wooden um, teeth to go onto metal cocks to prevent any sparks. And then over this side it's engaged, so you can see they're actually meshed. So when we're turning the sails we'd be turning this stone. Um, this central screw mechanism essentially is the one bit that winds that up and down to put the, put the drive on, if you like, turn it on. And this second one here, essentially this one lifts and lowers the runner stone to alter the pitch between them. Okay, so the bigger the gap, obviously the coarser the flower is going to be when it comes out. The, the closer, the finer the gap, the, the finer the flower. So the miller would essentially, everything would be running and then he could feel the quality of the flower pouring out of here from the hole. This is where the hole fed to above. When he's got it about where he thinks he wants it, then he could leave the adjustment set and the stone will be running. Fantastic. That all goes fantastic until the wind picks up or drops off. Um, then the, the sails either start moving faster or slower. As they move faster, everything starts to happen a lot quicker, so more grain goes in, which obviously gives more load to the stones, but also the fact that the top stone, the round stone, is spinning faster, it will tend to lift with centrifugal force, so that obviously opens that pitch again. So it basically it changes the grade of his flower. So we'd be back up here again, readjusting. Again, if the wind then changes, the process has all got to be repeated. <laughs> That can become essentially making him a slave almost to stand in here if it's a blustery day. So what they devised was the governor system, which is above your head. Yeah. Oh. So that would be driven off of the, the cogs above you with a leather belt to that wooden disc. Okay. And this would be spinning at the same time everything else is going. So as everything starts to move faster, as the wind picks up, these, these counterbalances on the governor move outwards, moves the beam down, basically pulls the runner stone back down again, or lets it back down again. So it governs the pitch to try and maintain the grade of the flower coming out. Okay. That then was copied onto steam engines, but it started life in windmills. The governor in steam engines, it was used to govern the rate the steam engines run out. And you'll see as they move outwards, as they're spinning faster, they pull on, they move this lever, 
which transfers across and you should see it pushes this lever down. Yeah? So as I lift them up, that lever goes down. Basically gear drive, so the sails are running 10, 12 RPM. The stones are running at 120, yeah. 100 to 120 yeah. RPM. And then put it into your bolter system. We have no idea where that was in this mill. Um, there's no drawings, pictures or anything to describe where it was. So that is purely a mock-up model of what one would look like. But essentially, it would have a drive at one end, um, which is up there which would be belt driven off of the wind shaft because that's obviously your source of power um, which would cause this drum to rotate your flour, your mixed flour from your sack over there would be fed in one end and then you've essentially got a very fine sieve a slightly coarser sieve and then the open end so as the mixed flour falls in and it's being trundled around the sieves the finest flour would drop through which would be your white flour send off a bright baking and cakes and whatever and then the brown coming out at the end, which was deemed to be useless, will just be sent off for animal so feed. So you're saying that brown bread is really slightly inferior, or is it just That rough? was the it's thinking just... then. Uh, obviously now, yeah, you're supposed to eat from this end. That's it, yeah. And, and, and do it completely different. So this little gizmo here essentially shows you the whole process in one go. So. We put some grain in there just to make sure there is some in there. As this is rotated, you should see quite soon the flour start coming out. There it comes out through the side of the two stones. So you imagine that's inside your box and then this is your brush coming round brushing the thing and sending it through the hole in the floor to the waiting sack. Yeah. So it's starting to pour through now. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Take that into your into your waiting sack. And then put it into your bolter system. Should then sieve it, and you sort of see a nice line. white flour coming through yeah. quite quickly. Yeah. And then we start getting more of the speckly bits, mm -hmm. we will call them the middlings. And then, if I was patient enough to do the whole thing, we'd be left with the stuff yeah. that I haven't ground at all mm -hmm. the bran. Is that how you pronounce it? Quern? Quern, yes. It's been owned by Hertfordshire Building Preservation Trust since 1967 and its restoration was made possible by generous grants from the Heritage Lottery Fund, English Heritage, Hertfordshire County Council and East Hertfordshire District Council. While Mr Albert Dowden, the local farmer, donated a sizeable corner of his field to provide the car park. Through them and the hard work of the Trust's team of volunteers, Cromer Windmill has begun a new phase in its long life for future generations to visit, to study, and above all, to enjoy. If you'd like to learn more about this historic building, the Preservation Trust's guidebook, Cromer Windmill by Luke Bonwick, is available here along with other interesting cards and publications. Do tell your friends about this, and if you haven't been already, why not visit the Trust's other project, the Forge Museum at Much Haddon, where you can see a restored and working Smithers Forge in action. Details of the museum's opening times are also available here. Thank you for watching, and for your support.
day there wouldn't have been the rail there in the first place. Mm. That's the slide that goes down to where it's loaded onto the cart. Thank mm-hmm. you.